John McMullen, 97.3 ESPN. I'm uh, I'm turning into the city planner. I'm a city planner. I'm a city planner, John. Hey, real quick, was that an, uh, a CBS guy sending that email? Because I get emails from CBS Sports Radio with that exact thing. You just click the answer. I love it. No, this was an ESPN guy. Um, uh, I think it's Gmail that does it. Yeah, I love it. I got to figure out how to do it. You have Gmail? I, I'm in that. I do have Gmail, yeah. but uh, I, I don't. The, the producers who asked me to be a guest, they send it from CBS, and I love it. I wish everybody did it. Well, maybe it's the person sending it more so than it is. I don't know. I, I, it's happened to be a couple of emails. Yeah, I think it's the person sending it. You have to set it up. Oh, okay. Whereas you're making it very easy. For the person to reply, huh. but I haven't figured out how to do it. That's yet. interesting. Okay, yeah, because it, it, if the if the Gmail account itself just knew what kind of question was being sent, and these are your no, that, these yeah, are that your would, default that would be answers, a scary. I'm a little creeped that out by that. Scary. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right, uh, Johnny Mack is with us. Uh, look at our NFL news and notes. Uh, a lot of things to touch on here. Uh, Eagles OTAs are off. What are they off till next week? No, tomorrow we pick up again. So tomorrow and Friday are the last two OTAs. Oh, that's right. Peterson's uh, then, talking tomorrow. Yeah, Peterson's talking tomorrow. He was supposed to talk Friday. The Eagles uh, flipped it. Uh, so now he's going to speak Thursday, and there's not going to be any media access Friday, uh, which is the final day. And I don't know if it has anything to do with it, but you remember the issues they had on the final day uh, last year. Uh, but that was after mini camp, so this is just OTAs. But so they flipped the script a little bit, and and then mandatory mini camp is next week. Um, I thought some interesting news came out of the first two days of mini camp this week. One of which, uh, Darren Sproles, who uh, yesterday Monday at his locker was asked, "Hey, uh, is everything kind of moving like this because you realize this is your last one?" and he kind of smiled and said, "Check back with me at the end of next year." So uh, Darren Sproles reconsidering retirement. Well, yeah, I mean, he kind of sort of hedged his bets now. Uh, and I, I mentioned it a little bit yesterday on the show. I don't blame him. He's still playing at a really high level. Uh, so I don't know why you would necessarily want to say I'm walking away. Uh, he, he's still a very effective player. Uh, certainly he has to be in limited doses. But uh, I, I think there's still a place for him in this league, and I think he can certainly play beyond uh, this contract. But the problem in Philadelphia is this is the last year of his deal, obviously, and uh, they drafted Donnell Pumphrey to replace him. So I'm not sure if he does want to continue to play, it's going to be in Philadelphia. But I certainly think he has the capability from a physical standpoint. It's amazing the explosion he has at his age. Uh, and he's 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 a workout warrior guy. I mean, he keeps himself in tremendous physical shape. Uh, he always has. He takes it very very seriously, and and he's been able sort of to weather uh, that mentality of thirty being the death knell for running backs. Now he's not the traditional running back in a lot of fashions. The fact he's never really been the bell cow anywhere because of the size, so he hasn't taken that. 300 carry punishment year after year after year but still usually when you play that position you lose it physically pretty quickly after 30 he has not he's just as quick and explosive as ever yeah well i mean he, he's a guy who hasn't had over 94 carries i think last year is the most times he's ever carried the football uh in a season right 94 is the most carries he's ever had well it, it, and that's Part the fact that, as I said, he doesn't carry the football a ton. He's never touched it a lot because people are aware of his size and those limitations. Obviously, there's a difference from you think about running backs. You go back in the day to Curtis Martin, how many times he would carry the ball every year. You want to go back even further to Earl Campbell, who was always one of my favorite running backs growing up, just how many times he would touch the football year after year after year, you kind of understand why those guys would wear down uh, once they got to a certain age. And he's been a, a special, you know, a specialized player for the entirety of his career. So that's part of the longevity, no question about it. 
Uh, I want to get some uh, some thoughts on a couple other things that are happening uh, at the OTAs as they get into the, the next phase tomorrow. One, Jordan Matthews, the knee injury there, he hasn't been able to get out there. Uh, that's giving more opportunities for a guy like Nelson Aguilar. And I know because it's OTAs and he had such a bad year last year and really has been a disappointment, but he seems like he has been a story. Is it just because it's OTAs and someone's looking for positive things? Or is it a noticeable difference in this player who was a first-round pick? Uh, I, I think he's he's played well, but I, I don't know if it's noticeable because I think this time last year he tends to play well in these types of environments. Uh, people were remarking last year how improved he looked from his rookie year uh, until we got the pads on uh, and until – things started to happen. So I, he has looked good, but he's looked good in the past. And, you know, there was a reason he was a first-round pick, and it's not because he's slow or he's not athletic uh, or he can't run routes. Or is, So to me, when you talk about Nelson Aguilar, it's always been a mental block uh, more than anything else. And, he's had a, and he admitted it uh, almost – it was painful to watch a little bit after that Seattle game last year when he basically said it's getting to him. And he, he almost, I, I don't want to call it a nervous breakdown, but he, he admitted uh, that the pressure uh, of the expectations got to him and he had to take a step back. And that's his issue. How do you overcome that? Uh, Brandon Brooks had had the same kind of problem with anxiety and forced him to, to miss a couple games. And it's one of those things you don't think about. We all act like these players are robots, but they have real world problems like the rest of us. And Nelson Aguilar is one of those guys who's had a really, really difficult time uh, living up to those expectations. And I I think if he can sort of turn that part of his brain off Mm -hmm. for lack of a better a way of describing it. I I think he's got the physical ability to play in this league. He seems like he's Uh, at least taking the right approach. I mean, he's got the whiteboard with the uh, sayings on it and quotes, and at least he's trying to be positive. Yeah, and, I, you know, I thought he was taking the right approach last year. Last year the story was he bought his own jugs machine and, and, you know, to try to stop the drops. Now, as you mentioned, he's got the whiteboard. He's charting all his drops. Uh, after he watches the films uh, of the practices and he, and he's putting uh, some quotes on there to, to get him going in the right direction. So I, I think I agree with you. He's taken the right approach, but he's taken the right approach in the past. I, I've never looked at Nelson Aguilar and said he's uh, not a hard worker. Uh, that hasn't been the problem. It's, to me, it's, it's, a, it's totally a mental hurdle. And until we actually see him on the field and and see what he does when the, when it matters, I I don't know if you're going to be able to ascertain if he's over it or not. The problem with him this year is if everybody's healthy and Alshon Jeffrey and Torrey Smith and Jordan Matthews are out there, he's just not going to have a lot of opportunities uh, to make a big difference on this offense. You wonder, um, if at this at this stage, the OTA stage, and then and, 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 in um, camp, uh, are they going to start taking a look at him as a slot guy to be the next? I mean, because Jordan Matthews on the last year of that deal, right? Yeah, he's in the last year of his rookie deal. He he has been. Jordan's been out with the knee tendonitis, and I, he'll probably be out the rest of the week. Uh, I wouldn't even guarantee he's going to be out there for many camp. I mean, this time of year, if you're healthy you should be out there playing. But if you're not, if you're a little bit off, there's no use putting a veteran player out there. So I, I think they're probably going to be continue to be cautious with Jordan Matthews, and that means Aguilar is going to be with the first team in the slot, and that's where he's been since basically uh, the second day of OTAs uh, when, when Jordan started having a, a little bit of an issue. So that's where he's been in the slot. And, yeah, if he can show something in his limited opportunities, uh, because we've talked about it uh, a lot, the Eagles basically have to keep him because if they cut him, uh, it would cost more money uh, to their salary cap than if they kept him. 
Uh, so he's going to be around this year. Uh, and if he can show something, uh, I mentioned it a little bit yesterday on the show. Yeah. I don't think Doug Peterson is enamored with Jordan Matthews' skill set. If you hear Doug talk, he, he talks a lot about versatility with receivers. And last year, if you remember, Mike, when we started, he would talk a lot about moving Jordan Matthews around and moving him outside. And then he became just a slot guy again. And the reason why is because he's just not fast enough to be outside the numbers. So I, I think Doug would prefer a quicker, a faster guy, and that's Nelson Aguilar if he can show something. Now, I'm not – somebody I'm sure is going to be on Twitter, Twitter saying, McMullen says Aguilar is beating out Jordan Matthews. That's not what I'm saying. He's not. But I'm saying if the Eagles decide to go in a different direction – and want to move on from Jordan Matthews, well, Nelson Aguilar has at least an opportunity to get back in the conversation on this team. Uh, yeah, remember it used to be uh, back in the day, you know, when we were uh, a little bit younger, John, uh, wide receivers, it was the third year. That was the breakout year for rookie, uh, for wide receivers. It was that third year. But there are certain wide receivers that have jumped into this league and had success so early that we don't kind of measure it by the third year anymore. Yeah, and, and really that couple years ago when he had all those receivers having big years, I, I was in Minnesota in 98 when the biggest of them all came, and that was Randy Moss. I think he had 17 touchdowns. Uh, but it, even in, it, when you look at – that's perhaps you know one of the three or four greatest receivers of all time. And even when you talk about a Randy Moss and having so much success uh, as a rookie – they still limited what he did. Uh, obviously, as a tremendous deep threat, he ran a, a ton of go routes and, and uh, a ton of sort of uh, just the ability to stretch the football field. The Vikings used him in that way. They also had Chris Carter and Jake Reed at the time. So uh, they had a lot of depth at the wide receiver position, and, and they started him slowly. So I, I actually talked to Matt Collins about this, in the locker room the other day, I asked him, do they throw the whole route tree at you as a rookie or do they bring you along incrementally? And he said, no, it's slow going. And that's because you can't, yeah. as a rookie receiver, you can't learn all those routes and, and all three positions and everything you need to do to be a real true number one receiver uh, so it's always a process, and yeah, people often expect too much out of rookie receivers. Uh, is there a competition at left guard? Yeah, I think there is. I think it's a weighted competition. I think the Eagles want Isaac Samalu to win the job. Uh, he's running with the first team, uh, but Alan Barber's there. And for the first time when we were there on Monday, Allen got some reps with the first team. Now, he was out at the beginning of OTAs. He had a little bit of a calf injury. We know from last season he can handle the position. And then he also have Wisniewski and, and, and Chance Warmack. And I, wouldn't, I wrote about Chance on 973ESPN.com today. I wouldn't sleep on him because of all the guys and all the, the, the guards they have on this team, He's the best athletically. Now, obviously, he was a bust in Tennessee, but he's back with Jeff Stoutland, the offensive line coach who coached him at Alabama. And the Eagles are sort of rolling the dice with a guy who's got tremendous physical skill. And, and they signed him to a uh, uh, $500,000 guarantee. So if it doesn't work out, they just cut him. Yeah. But he's an interesting – uh, prospect because he is so talented athletically he's off the charts I mean he was a top 10 pick as a guard as a guard in this league and that just doesn't happen that often so I, I think the hope is you swing for the fences with him uh, but the most logical scenario is that Isaac Sayamala was the starter. But I, I think it is a weighted competition, as I said. Yeah, that, that's an interesting one because it's a hard – let's say Warmack goes out there and is definitively having a better camp. I mean, do they just say, look, we drafted Sayamala in the third – was it third round uh, or fourth round and just say, you know what, 
This guy was number 10 overall, and he's proven it now. Uh, do they go that route? Do they legitimately give – if Warmack proves that he is, you know, as athletic and as talented as he had been, and he's now showing that, do they really give him the starting job? I think they will if he if he plays lights out through training camp. Yeah, I mean, I think they realize what kind of talent. I mean, Stoutland, better than anyone, knows what he was at Alabama. So it, it's not like he's coming in. He signed here for a reason, and he signed here to, to sort of reunite with, with Jeff uh, because he has so much respect for him, even though there wasn't really, if you look at the roster, an opening. So he wanted to be here to reunite with Jeff Stoutland. Uh, so you have that aspect of it. Uh, and, and, and then you have the realization that probably uh, the Eagles have said consistently behind the scenes, they think ultimately the best position for Isaac Samala was center. So from this team's standpoint, they ultimately see him as the next starting center after Jason Kelsey is gone. So it's not like even if he beats out, say, Amalo for the left guard spot, it's not like the Eagles would be saying, well, this guy's a bust as a third-round pick. We don't like him. They would still have him penciled in likely in, in 2018 as the starting center. John McMullen, uh, read that piece, by the way, Warmack getting the second chance uh, over at 973ESPN.com. We have it up on our Facebook page as well. Uh, a couple NFL things, John, I want to dive into. Uh, Macklin left Buffalo today. He's going to meet with mm. Baltimore. Is Baltimore a better fit for Macklin? Well, it's a better fit if he wants to compete in this league and he wants to be on a playoff team. Uh, and I said from the start, you, you, you really have to – Jeremy has to sit down and make some decisions. He could probably – not probably. He could definitely make more money elsewhere because Baltimore's up against it uh, from a salary camp standpoint where you have teams that have a ton of space like San Francisco and Cleveland. They all need, uh, obviously, wide receiver help, uh, but they're really, really bad football teams. The same is said for the Los Angeles Rams. They have a significant need. Their best receiver is Robert Woods, so that tells you they need a receiver. Uh, and Buffalo is, is another team that needs a receiver. They're a little bit better than those three teams, but I don't think anyone looks at Buffalo and says they're going to be a, a potential playoff team. So of, of all the options uh, as far as competing and as far as wanting to go to the postseason, Baltimore would be the best one for them. Yeah, that's a, uh, uh, definitely a team that uh... – uh, has struggled with the offense of, you know, Steve Smith uh, being gone. So, uh, you know, uh, they need some wide receiver help there as well. Uh, the Jets have been a big topic. Eric De uh, Eric Decker looks like he's going to get released. Uh, it, it looks like the Jets are turning into the Sixers. <laughs> yeah, or or the Cleveland Browns. I think, I think they look at Cleveland. If anything, <laughs> they might have a worse roster than Cleveland had last year, <laughs> at least on paper. Uh, it's bad. Uh, I mean, and it, it starts at, at the quarterback position. I, I think when you look at David Harrison, they're going to release uh, most likely Eric Decker because they're not going to be able to trade him. Uh, you you kind of – it's understandable for the, from the standpoint that you know those guys aren't going to be there when you get good again. So what's the point uh, of paying that money? Uh, it's it's a tough, it's a cold league as far as when they got cut because they're still NFL-level players, and obviously it's much tougher uh, now that every off-season roster is filled. There's not as much money out there. So from a player standpoint, it's really, really difficult. But from the Jets standpoint, it's, it's understandable because they're going to be a terrible team with David Harris and Eric Decker. So why pay the money to be a terrible team with them when he can be a terrible team without them? Yeah, well, it goes down the slippery slope where you're going to start – I mean, other teams going to start following suit where they're letting veterans go because they don't think they're going to be very good? Yeah, I, I think it is, and I think it is. We, we always talk about that in the NBA with the Sixers, obviously, the well, Cleveland and, Browns. And, John, because, because in basketball, the, the draft, you know, is so uh, – 
unfulfilling. There's only a handful of players in the draft, so getting being bad to find a good player is a necessity. Typically in football, I mean, you can have the seventh pick in the draft and still be in, in pretty good shape. You don't have to have a disastrous season to really, you know, what's the difference between being 3-13 and 13 and 0-16? And Why would you do that to yourself? No, I agree. It's it, Obviously, it's much more difficult in the NFL because you could get one superstar and, and turn it around completely in the NBA if you get the right one, uh, whereas it's much more difficult to do that in the NFL. And it's really basically about one position. Right. Uh, and I mean, it's, it's got to be a year Miles, that there's a quarterback involved. Exactly. As good as Miles Garrett is, I said it, it – he might turn into the next Deacon Jones, but it, it doesn't really matter exactly. unless Cleveland gets the quarterback at some point. Uh, we see and that in yeah, Houston. I mean, we see that in Houston. I yeah. mean, J.J. Watt, consistently one of the best defensive players in the league, if not the best, and uh, they can't win a playoff game. Well, I've, got, I, I've said it. J.J. Watt has won three Defensive Player of the Year awards. He is one of the best five defensive linemen that have ha, has ever lived and it is extremely extremely unlikely that miles garrett will ever become what jj watt is or was because we'll see as he comes back from the injuries but at his apex he was just an unstoppable defender in the mold he, he was a reggie white type player yeah. that's how good he was at his apex and where did that get the Houston Texans? You know, it's just you have to be realistic. I said the same thing on the offensive side of the ball when Adrian Peterson was at his apex. As good as he was, and I don't think I've ever seen a better year uh, than his MVP year from a running back. Think about winning the MVP in this era of football, Mike, as a running back. Over 2,000 yards. And But where did that get Minnesota? Nowhere. Right. If you don't have the quarterback, you can't be consistently. I shouldn't say nowhere. These teams have made the playoffs, but they're not significant Super Bowl contenders. And that's what everybody's shooting for. And to be that, you have to have the quarterback. There's no question about it. And speaking of quarterbacks, uh, i got to get your take on Kaepernick. Uh, he did not go to Seattle. They end up going with Austin Davis. Uh, it appears – that uh, he will not have a job come training camp time. And uh, I don't know. I mean, is it is it fair to say that he is not one of the top 90 quarterbacks in the world? No. He, he obviously is, is one of the uh, top, if you think about third-string quarterbacks and you want to look at it that way, he's certainly no one can argue that he wouldn't want to be uh, one of the best 96 quarterbacks in, in this league. But people don't like context. I say it all the time on Twitter. Mm -hmm. There's context to that. Uh, there are third-string quarterbacks and fourth-string camp arms in this league that are playing for the league minimum and willing to come in for that. Uh, Colin Kaepernick's not willing to do that. Right. He's not willing to come in. Do you think in. Kaepernick's biggest issue right now is signability? Yeah. Uh, I, well, there's a couple things. That's part of it. He, he could clear this up very quickly. Remember, he or his camp have never really come out and stated, we'll play for this. So if he's willing to play for the veteran minimum to be a backup, he should have a job. There's no question about it. Uh, but again, you have to put the context into it. Now, look at San Francisco, for instance. Now, people say, well, Colin Kaepernick's better than – uh, Brian Hoyer is scheduled to be the starter in San Francisco. Yeah. And in theory, he's certainly more talented. There's no question about that. But think about who the coach is now. The coach is Kyle Shanahan. In what world is Colin Kaepernick a better fit for a Kyle Shanahan offense than Brian Hoyer? If you believe that, you don't know anything about the NFL. So scheme enters into it. There's not a lot of teams that play the type of scheme that Colin would excel at, that enters into it, money enters into it, and then, yeah, the distraction of what he did certainly is another part of it. Well, the uh, report from Pro Football Talk was that Kaepernick was willing to accept backup money. The Seahawks ex decided uh, basically to move on, and then Pete Carroll you know, said that, well, he's a starting-level player. 
Uh, I, I don't know. That, that, it seemed that Carroll didn't help the situation out. Well, <laughs> with all due respect, and I, you know, I mean, Pete Carroll's a great coach in this league. They, they signed Austin Davis to, I think, $780,000. Colin Kaepernick's not playing for that. I don't care what Mike, Mike Florio says. I, and, and Mike Freeman's been the other one. And I'll call them out on the radio. I mean, those have been two guys that have tried to put forward this narrative for whatever reason. Okay. You'd have to speak to them directly. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know what it is. Uh, but the assumption that Pete Carroll, and, and, and I know pro, fall, pro Football Talk tried to you know advance this, is that Pete Carroll didn't want Colin Kaepernick competing with Russell Wilson. And it's like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Russell Wilson it, it has been one of the winningest – uh, quarterbacks in NFL history through this point of his career. Yeah, He's won a Super Bowl. He was a yard away from another Super Bowl. He's a top 10 quarterback in this league. There is no competition between Colin Kaepernick and Russell Wilson. It's an absurd narrative, and nobody should buy it. Uh, it should be uh, interesting to see what ends up happening. A lot of people have suggested – you know, that he's blackballed. Do you uh, feel that that's the case with Kaepernick? Well, that's uh, uh, there's two <laughs> definitions of blackball, and they're both absurd. The first would be that all NFL decision makers are a monolith, and they all agree the exact same way, and that's just not true. Anyone who knows, I talked to Tory Smith about this and wrote about it on FanRag sports.com and the fact that he was a teammate with Colin obviously in San Francisco. Jed York is one of the most progressive political guys in the world. Uh, The fact that you think he agrees politically with more conservative owners, say like uh, Amara or or Rooney or people of that nature uh, and even Rooney when you talk about the Rooney rule. but And then in this town, Jeffrey Lurie tremendously liberal guy. So to act like these guys all have the same political views is just incorrect. Now, from a legal sense, basically collusion or blackball is between a league and a team or two teams. So that could be a little bit more palatable, but there's not two teams saying hey, we're going to try to keep Colin Kaepernick out of the NFL. And what I wrote a couple weeks ago, and this is the key to it all, Mike. This is what you have to center your listeners on. If the NFLPA thought in any way that Colin Kaepernick was being blackballed, they would be raising a stink. You haven't heard a word from him. You know why? Because he's not being blackballed. It's just not true. And I, I, I'm sorry if people want to believe it. It, it is just not too. true. Have teams flagged him? There's no question. No question. Certain teams have said, uh, look, we don't want this guy. No question. Just like a lot of teams flagged Joe Mixon and, and other players in the draft. Yeah. So if you want to say he's been flagged by certain teams, 100% you're correct. But blackball, no way. Uh, John McMullen at JF McMullen. Uh, check him out, FanRag Sports NFL, and, of course, all the Eagles coverage at 97.3 ESPN.com. We went a little late, my friend, but uh, good stuff from you as always. The NFL News and Notes will do it again tomorrow. Uh, sorry, Mike, I get a little wordy when you get me going. <laughs> hey, it was good stuff. Uh, and guess what? Uh, tomorrow the Eagles are back at OTAs. Doug Peterson speaks, so we'll have plenty more to discuss. John McMullen, everybody here, uh, brought to you by BMW of Atlantic City. The ultimate driving experience is closer than you think at BMW of Atlantic